Today we continue in our study in Romans chapter 6 and we're going to be reading the 23 verses of Romans 6. <clears throat> Actually this 6th chapter is one of three chapters that need to be taken together in the context. Chapters 6 through 8 deal with this matter of sanctification through uh, our union with the life of Christ and what was accomplished in His death and in our salvation. And in chapter 6 today, we look at this matter uh, that we must know that we can be saved from the power of sin. But really the chapters need to be read together. And chapter 6 uh, sets the standard and I think seven is perhaps more the reality of the struggle between the two natures. And chapter eight gives us the victory, how to experience the victory of the power of the Holy Spirit lifting up the life of the Lord Jesus in our hearts and in our lives. And so today we gladly look at how we can be saved from the power of sin but before we do, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, what an awful, terrible, hurtful problem sin is in our lives. But it's not something that you're unaware of or not something you're surprised by. <clears throat> and Lord, you have made provision for us. You have given us the answer. And we are told the answer to the power of sin in our lives in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Lord, too often we live in the struggle of it in Romans 7. May we experience the victory of it in chapter 8. But here in 6, may we see what you have accomplished. May we see what is possible for our Christian life. And Lord, may we yield and trust and believe and understand what your will is. And may we experience victory over the power of sin in our lives. We know that you've saved us and that we need to be like you, that it's better and it's necessary for us to live in the spirit and not in the flesh. That the flesh only causes problems and produces sin. And what we want and our will and our wisdom and our perspectives comes to nothing but disaster. Lord, we can't live in the flesh and please you. But Lord, you've given us something better than that. And thank you for the provision that you've given us. Lord, you know that we are but dust, that we are so sinful. But Lord, how accountable we are because you've given us everything necessary for us to live a victorious Christian life. And one day we're going to have to stand and, and, and give reasons why we neglected your word and the leadership and ministry of the Holy Spirit and the power of the person of Christ in our lives and why we didn't do more than we did and we weren't faithful more than we are. Oh God, we confess our sin and we uh, trust and cling to what you can do through us. And we rejoice in your great salvation today. Help us to understand these truths we ask in the name of your Son who loved us and died for our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Know ye not that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. 
For we have been planted together in the likeness of His death. We shall also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with Him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died in sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed into sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should obey its lust. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not to whom ye yield your serve, your self servants to obey? His servants you are, whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that whereof, as we were the servants of sin, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members' servants unto uncleanness, and to iniquity, and to iniquity, even so... Yield yourselves members servants to righteousness and to holiness. For when we were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit have you now, then now, in those things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But being made free from sin and become servants of God, you have fruit into holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is eternal death. Spiritual, eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Romans 6, we see what God wants. The Christian life of the believer to be all about. And especially what God wants in this matter of changing the power of sin in our life. This is God's standard. This is what God has achieved through the work and death of His Son and the giving of that life to us who believe that the life of Christ and the work of the Spirit may be lived through us and in us. Here is the possibility. Here is what can be and should be. Unfortunately, I think chapter 7 is the reality of what most of the time is. And perhaps even worse than that, in the sinful, fleshly lives that Christians live today. But even in the Apostle Paul, that great giant of the faith... In chapter 7, we see that he struggled the old nature with the new. And so will we, friend. But here we have the possibilities. We have what God wants. We have what God would have us to do and, and what we can achieve. And we're told how to achieve that in Romans 8. But here we are told, here is the standard. Here is the possibility. And this word sanctification... It means set apart. It's the same word that the word holy comes from. Same root word. And believers are different after they get saved. 
before we got saved, we could only see it. We could, we had, but our old nature, we didn't have the new nature. We didn't have the life of God in us. We were spiritually dead. But upon faith and 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 salvation and justification and reconciliation, the possibility of sanctification is there because the life of Jesus, raised from the dead, lives in the life of the believer. He is our life. And that salvation has come to live on the inside. And because that has occurred, we are different. We are set apart by the life and character of God in us. And there ought to be a difference in the way that we live. And there will be. Paul really describes what is possible in the new Christian's life, the Christian's life, this new life of Christ in us in the church age. And he gives an illustration. And he's not saying that we're sinless. And he's not saying that the old nature goes away entirely. It's like a TV. It's like a computer. It's like a radio. Unless that instrument is plugged into the power source, it will not work. It is dead. Where there is no power, there is no life. And Paul teaches here in this sixth chapter, and we're going to see, and he uses four words that your study Bible indicates in this chapter. They're know and, and reckon and, and, or count on and yield and obey, but we see them in the sequence of the passage. But by following this procedure and listening to what Paul says that God has done and accomplished in salvation... The old nature is unplugged and can be left unplugged. That is, now we don't have to see it. Before we got saved, we could only see it. We had but one nature. Now we have another nature. And Christ has left the old nature powerless and unplugged. It's not plugged into the power source. But too often, without thinking, we plug the thing in and operate in the old nature. We turn the power back on. I hope temporarily. I hope it's a short-lived space of time. I hope that our Christian life are dominated by the use and control of the, the new nature and the Spirit of God in the person of Jesus Christ. I fear that my, most Christians don't know much of the dominance of God in their Christian life. But even those of us that should be mature and are mature, I, I fear that, that much of the time, without thinking, sometimes by thinking and by being determined to follow our own wisdom and have our own way and handle our own problems, we plug the old nature back in. And turn that monster on to operate in our lives. But here's the picture of what could be and what is in reality. That God has so rendered the old nature. So that the power source has been disconnected. And can remain so much of the time. Though perfection is not what he's teaching here. But he is teaching that, that the spirit and the new life and the life of Christ that the believer has, that has been united with, that is his life, his spiritual life, should dominate in this thing and thereby we be set apart and different and uh, living the Christian life as God intended it to be lived. Thank God that God has unplugged the old nature and we don't have to. We don't have to. We can, uh, we can trust and yield and obey and believe and know and let the life of Jesus dominate our Christian life. Thank God there is deliverance from this old monster of sin to a degree in our life even now. One day we're going to be rid of the thing for good. But right now it should be like the TV. It, it should be unplugged and off in our homes and the old nature needs to be unplugged and off in our Christian life and that's possible 
you can know that you've been saved from the power of sin. And in verses 1 through 10, Paul tells us that we can know the means of our sanctification. And he emphasizes the word know. Truth is always based upon facts. Before we can believe and implement God's will, we need to know it. And so Paul explains the facts about sanctification here. He explains how that baptism, water baptism, is a picture of what happened when we trusted the Lord Jesus. That spiritually we are identified with Him in His death for us on the cross. And that that death on the cross changed the situation in our lives. And now we have two natures. And we have His life. And He's pulled the plug on the old nature so that the thing is off. And, and we don't have to see it anymore. And we don't have to do our own will anymore. And we don't have to be driven by our own wisdom anymore. The, that something occurred because of salvation and the cross work of Christ and the new life that's in us. And he talks about the, the fact of the resurrected life in 4 and 5 living in us. That Jesus who died is the one that lives within our lives. It is His spiritual life that is our, our, our Christian life now. And, and He did this and accomplish this for a lot of reasons. And one that is in verse 7 that we might be free from always living in that old nature of sin. If we are dead with Christ, we are free now to live with Him and let Him live through us. And in verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, Death and sin has no more power over him. He is forever freed from that. The believer who has his life should be forever free to live in the power and the life of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing to know. To know that salvation accomplished so much, not only keeping us out of hell, but that the life of Christ who we received upon believing unplugs the old nature of sin and gives us the possibility of living in that new nature. And not only the possibility, the reality of that. And that's the way God wants us to live. And that's the way we can live. And that's the way you must live, Christian. Because the old nature cannot please God and it cannot do the work and it cannot live the Christian life. And I say again that your Christian life is not something you do for God out of your energies and your abilities and your wisdom and your strength. It is something that you let God do through you because He's in you and He's provided these things for you. And so we know the facts that the, the old nature has been unplugged and we have a new life. We have Christ within us. We have God within us. We have the Spirit is ministry within us. And that that life wants, God wants to use to use His life to live through us and in us instead of the old nature and the old life. And not only do we know in verses 11 and 12 we reckon or we count on the facts being true. We count on it. This is, this is the same uh, word that were in a few chapters before. Uh, David says that, that the Lord will not impute. He will not reckon. He will not charge. He will not uh, put to one's account the iniquity of the, uh, the sin that he deserves because of salvation through, uh, by faith through, and grace. And here the believer in his life is to count on what God said being true. And here's this matter of faith and trust. We depend on Christ to do what he said he would do. And Paul says his life is in us and the resurrected power of Christ is there. And, and, and we are, live our Christian life because we are, are united. We are in him and he is in us. And that is our Christian life. And that that life wants to control and dominate 
and through these bodies of flesh, these bodies of clay, now on this earth. And that we need to trust and count on those facts being true. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead and to sin. Now, I know that I'm still a sinner, and I know that the old nature is still there, but I can count on and trust and say, Lord, I'm going to depend on you to control my life, and I want that thing unplugged. I want it off. And, and I'm going to count on you keeping it off as much. I want you to dominate me. I want you to control me, Lord. And Lord, I know that I, I'm still a human being, and I know that 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 old nature is so very present with me that sometimes I'm going to, without thinking, flip that switch here on and cut the power back on. But Lord, I want you to dominate me and I'm going to trust you to do that, to do your work that you promised to do. That I might live through the Lord Jesus Christ that lives within me. That sin not reign. Now sin is still there. I still sin. Because remember, sin is not just doing, not doing the things that I know that I ought not to do. And by the way, that's a list. The list is a lot longer than twenty things or thirty things that we should not do. But sin is also not doing what I know that I should do. And sin is doing what I should do by faith. And not for any other motivation. And whatsoever is not of faith is of sin. Paul says. So sin is a wide, all-compassing monster that is so very much present with me. But now I tell you, Christian, sin should not and does not have to dominate and reign. It does not have to control your mortal life the way it did for you got saved. It should not. It must not. You will not live the Christian life if the old nature controls and the power has been unplugged and you can leave the thing off and you have the newness of the life of Christ Jesus in you and you need to count on and believe and reckon those things to be true because the facts are true and this can be a reality in your life. And then we need to yield control of our lives to the Holy Spirit in 12 and 13. Now it is the Holy Spirit's ministry to do this. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. It's His ministry to do that in the believer's life. It is the Holy Spirit that teaches us the Word of God. He wrote and guided men and it is His office and His work to teach us. It is the Holy Spirit who lifts up the person of Jesus in our life. And so we yield to His control because that falls in the area of His ministry <coughs> and the reason why He's in our life. And so we yield to the Holy Spirit in 12 and 13. 13, neither yield yourselves as members of instruments of the righteousness, unrighteousness, unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments righteousness. We yield. We turn loose the control and we depend on and, and ask and trust God. Trust the Spirit to do what He said He will and wants to do in our life. So we know and we count on, we reckon, and we yield in 12 and 13. And then in 15 through 23, we obey. Now, child of God, understand that, that if it is not the life of Jesus living through you, that your perfunctory keeping or trying to keep God's will in your life, is not going to produce what God wants. But when you do know, and when you do reckon, and when you do heal, and when it is the life of Jesus that is uh, carrying out the wishes of God and the, the principles of Scripture in your life, that this produces a situation of righteousness, and that His righteousness is demonstrated in our life. And it is not our faithfulness or our obedience that comes from us 
that merit God's favor. It is the faithful living of the Lord Jesus in us that produces His character and His righteousness. And that's what God approves in our lives. We're not under law. We're not saved by law. We cannot keep God's holiness. Verse 14 tells us we're under grace. But that is no reason or excuse to sin. And by the way, many Christians use that as an excuse today. Oh, we're all sinners. Yes, we are. And, and, and we're not saved by our efforts and works. And yes, that's true. So the conclusion is, what does it matter what I do? Well, Paul says it matters a great deal. And it matters to God because he's given you the life of Christ. And what a waste, what a, a, a ungrateful attitude of a child of God to say I'm saved by your gift and your, your free gift of love and Christ's death on the cross. But now that I'm saved, I'm going to live my life for myself. And I don't care about what you want in your life and your righteousness. Paul said, don't you understand that who you obey, the old nature or the new, is going to produce results of that. And the old nature produces uh, corruption and death and unrighteousness. And the life of Christ produces righteousness and the character of God. And, and whose servants is being uh, who you're obeying in your life, if it is the life of Christ. It is pleasing to God and it produces what God wants. And if it's not, it, it produces corruption and chastening and sin and loss. And Paul says, before you got saved, you didn't have anything to do with righteousness. You couldn't do righteous acts. You could only be a slave to sin. And now that you're saved, what fruit have you in those things which you're now ashamed? Christian, why are you interested in, in, in the old life that only brings the problem and destruction and, and sin and loss? And so we're to let the Lord Jesus produce His righteousness in us. For the payday of sin and unbelief is eternal death. And that's in the lost person. It's not physical death here. Physical, every human being in the world would hope that that would be true. That the, the payday for sin is just physical death and that's the end of it. No eternal retribution. That's not what Paul said here. He said the payday of sin is spiritual eternal death in hell and separated from God forever and being punished, retributed for our sins if the person remains unsaved. But the wonderful, blessed gift of God is eternal life. And that life has begun now in our hearts, Christian. That life is Jesus in our heart now. And why would we take the most wonderful gift that God could ever give, that the world could ever know, and pour garbage and filth and refuge and dung, pour all of that on God's wonderful gift, and Christian, if you're living in that old nature, if you're in rebellion and disobedience and, and stubbornness and selfishness have plugged that thing back in and it's dominating in your life, you are putting garbage in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ that lives within you. What ungratitude and what sin and what awful loss you're going to suffer if you continue to live that way. And God shows us here that we don't have to live that way. And he shows us the standard of what he has made possible through the death and salvation that we have in his son. And you don't have to be continually plugged in to that old nature of sin. That thing can be rendered dead and not dominant and not reigning and not producing the kind of life that you lived when you were unsaved. You have the wonderful life of Christ. Let him live through you to die. I pray. God has called you to be set apart. It is his purpose. It is his work. We can be free from the domination of the power of the old sinful nature. Praise God. And amen.